lifted hands, the sign of surrender, the sign of I trust. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Uh, John, before you leave, I want to tell you something. Um, when, the, when, when Tampa Bay uh, landed in uh, Green Bay at the airport in Green Bay, the pilot announced, touchdown, Green Bay. <laughs> as we know, John's a diehard Green Bay fan, as those folks on his side of the country. I, I thought, dang, that's a pretty funny... Um, this is for tithes, offerings, and the prayers, reports, information, things. Okay, here's an interesting idea. If you're going to fill out these prayer requests, and, and we do this, in the, and, and, and there's no, no, I'm not jabbing anybody, okay? Okay, neighbors got this, or neighbor needs that, I'll fill this out, that's it. Somebody else will pray. Well, if you care enough to write it out, why don't you show up and uh, pray with them? I know, I know, novel idea. So uh, do we have the, the announcements up there? Oh, I get to use my thing. I got a laser. <laughs> you guys are just making fun of me. Okay, it's got to go this end. Oh. Do we have the announcements? That's what I'm looking for. Uh, prayer, uh, 79 Sun. Okay, let's pull it together here, kid. Prayer is at 7 o'clock on Monday nights. Uh, intercessory prayer is at 4 o'clock on uh, Seven, se, su, Monday night at 7. Uh, see that? See that? See that? And then we have one at 4 o'clock on Saturday, intercessory prayer. The one on Saturday um, is different, a little different than the one on Monday. Monday we go through all the prayer requests and that kind of things. Saturday is more of an in-depth, not in-depth. That's not, How do you do that? Prayer is prayer, right? Not. There's different types of prayer, just like there's different types of tongues. And we'll get into that as time goes on. So, we have prayer at Monday nights at 7 and prayer at Saturdays at 4. Next. By the way, we're, sending oursel we're saving ourselves lots of paper. You know, um, we're, we're, we're saving the trees. Otherwise, we'd be printing off 100 bulletins a week. Youth group starts this Saturday. Sunday. Monday. So I knew it was, a, it was a, I knew it ended in day. Okay. Okay. Uh, youth group uh, starts Thursday, 6 to 8. Here's your new youth pastors over here, and we're excited about it. It's going to be a great thing. High schoolers, uh, 9 to 12, 9th grade to 12th grade. And what are you guys doing this week? Okay. Are we going to have food? Ooh. <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, at the best pizzas in town. So uh, bring, bring a friend, ninth grade to 12th grade. Uh, bring a friend and be there. It's going to be a good time. And pizza. <laughs> okay, next. Women's Bible study, Friday morning at 10 to 12. Books are here, and if you would like um, to pick up your copy today, is there a cost for this? $16 for the workbook and book. And if you can't afford that, um, we will have some scholarship, partial scholarships. And uh, I'll just make that happen. Okay. So, and hey, if you want to help somebody else get a book, that'd be nice. So that starts... Uh, this Friday uh, at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, coffee and tea will be provided. <laughs> uh, if you want cookies, you got to bring your own. No. <laughs> Next. Okay, there we go. Uh, starting next 
month, we're going to, that's our goal, this 500 boxes. It's going to fill the whole wall up in there. And so there's a lot to say about that. And next week, two weeks from now, we'll have a, or three weeks from now, we'll have a short clip uh, about that. So contact Ed and Mary. If you don't know what it's about, contact Ed and Mary. Ed and Mary are over there. This is fun. Okay. Church business meeting, once a year annual business meeting uh, for all members uh, after church next Sunday. Um, usually takes as short of time as I can make it, um, but you'll look over all the finances and what we've done in the last year and uh, all the cool things that God is doing. Amen? Hey, just for giggles, it's not going to show up on this year, but it'll show up on next year's report. We had 16 people join the church in January. That's pretty good. Amen. Amen. Somebody's saying, hey, this is where God called me to plant. This is where God called me to grow, and this is where God called me to use my gifts. Amen. College age group meeting February the 1st. Um, contact Kathy. Uh, it's high school seniors since they're right at the end. Up to 25, and you can be married if you want to go to this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I was 25, uh, three or four decades ago. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, it's going to be, they're doing the Alpha Course, which I very, very much approve of. Alpha Course is an excellent, excellent course. It's 10 weeks. You guys got all kinds of cool things. You got a, um, a retreat. You get dinners. You, you meet, at, meet at the Lakey's house. How cool is that? Ugh. You know, and so that, that is... Uh, it, it's an excellent thing, and it's a real good way to meet the other young people, young adults. Everybody's young when you get to my age. Age is just a, what do they say? It's a place of mind. Which mind? Next. That's it? That's all we're doing? My goodness, that's every day of the week. We got, and if you uh, would like to join worship team or you need to see Roger or Sharon. Amen. Um, if you'd like to participate in any of the ongoing ministries, please call the church office. We always have a place. It's my job to teach, to train the saints to do the work of the ministry. It's not my job to do the work of the ministry. I do what I'm called to do. Amen. I, I, I can't do everything for everybody else. And I'm really, really bad at playing any instrument known to man. Am I blocking off my... Uh... Oh, there's a video for what? Oh, yes, yes. We would like the video for the Alpha Series. Thank you. Here's the video for the Alpha Series. Where's that little... <laughs> you can't know. We're gonna scare Jason with this spider. Come on, we're gonna get him back. Watch it, guys. This is a film set. You got it. Oh. Tons of things happen in our lives every day, and in a 24-hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions, like, "What should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with?" Sometimes we ask bigger questions, like, "What do I want to be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live?" But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up an atheist at home, I wasn't just going to accept what he was going to say. So I was like, okay, 
did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not going to just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we want to invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. It's a great series. I've used it a couple of times, and I fully approve of it. Amen? How many of you have heard the word unity in the last few months? Bible says, blessed is how, how, how good and pleasant it is and when, when brethren dwell together in unity. Psalms 133, it's there that the Lord pours out his anointing. It's a great thing. I, I, I've heard a lot about unity. Well, it's, it's, it's over. Let's just unify and go forward. But Paul says this. Do not be unequally yoked together with the unbelievers. By the way, 2 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 14 to 17, really are, by most scholars, believe that's just a, it's a fragment of another letter. When Paul, you know, six times Paul says in Corinthians, uh, from my previous letter. And he says in 1 Corinthians three times, six times in 1 Corinthians, Letter. Well, then why have we called 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians if Paul acknowledges he's got previous letters? This section in 2 Corinthians is from one of the previous letters where Paul's identifying problems in the church. He's identifying, hey, we, we, need, to, we need to take a good, hard look, and we don't want to just go, get along, go along to get along. Does that make sense to anybody besides me? There are standards that the Bible has for every believer. It doesn't mean we reject people but it means we stand up for the truth in Jesus Christ. Amen? There's truth, and there's your opinion. There's not your truth. There's truth, and there's your opinion. And we need to understand as people that we are here to be at peace. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Now, that's hard to do sometimes. Have you ever met somebody you just couldn't get along with? I don't mean your spouse. There are some people I don't... There are some people I have decided, and I feel it's biblical, at some point in life, not your spouse, you just walk away from. Just let it go. Just shake the dust from your feet and go. But that's not true of the majority of people. The majority of people we can deal with if our heart and our attitude is biblical. If we deal with confrontation, if we deal with problems and people like Jesus did. One of the things we're going to see when Jesus deals with confrontation, he pauses. In every situation, there's a pause where Jesus just stops. And we're going to use that as an acronym for the next couple of weeks in a sermon. And we need to understand that we need to look to Jesus and the Word of God in how to deal with our conflicts, not our emotions. I don't know about you, but I'm dealing with people who are believers. And I'm probably going to slap, cut back quite a bit. Well, we're going back and forth, man. We're going back and forth. I'm asking for facts, not feelings. Give me your facts, not feelings. This is what the Bible says, not your feelings. Well, Jesus was a social justice warrior. No, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Social justice should flow out of a working relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't come before a working relationship with Jesus Christ. There is so much that we need, and, but, but when we cut people off, we stop the ability to reach them for Jesus Christ. One of the people that I've been dealing with uh, for years has sent the most vile, vile things about the past president. And, I, and this week wrote... I can't believe that. They're, they're, 
They're opening up all the military bases and everywhere else. Abortion on demand, anywhere you want to go up to up and through birth, and, uh, paid for by the U.S. government, around the world. And I wrote back, I said, are you kidding me? Are you shocked? And, and don't you judge me. I said, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. See, the problem is we need to learn how to discuss with people dealing with difficulties without ending the relationship. Be at peace with all people if it is possible. Please notice if it is possible. Okay? Let's be honest. There are some people it is impossible. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you when to back away. It doesn't mean it, Jesus is there. If they're not going to receive dust. Shake off the dust and keep on walking. Let, we're just going we're, we're gonna to look at a number of things in the next couple of weeks, but I want to just start with Jesus. I think that would be a good place to start in learning to deal with difficulties. And let's go to John, the 8th, 6th chapter. And, and, whoops. No, let's put this back in here. Put that back over there. Let's go John, to John. And we're going to go to the 8th chapter. And it starts with, and everyone went to his own house. Now, they were talking about Jesus. Now it starts, well, and, and by the way, just to help you out, if the Bible doesn't look like it flows sometimes, it's because all chapters and verses were divided up by a monk who was sitting on the back of a donkey going from Paris to Rome. And that was his goal, was to divide the Bible, the, you know, the letters that he had at the time, into chapter and verse so they'd be easier for people to find. And so... He was probably sleeping somewhere when he decided he was going to mesh John 7 with John 8. John 8 begins, and Jesus went to the, um, he went to the mountain, Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people, while he was teaching, it's in perfect tense, was teaching. It said he taught. No, it's while he was teaching. A lot of times, one of the, confrontation happens when we're in the middle of doing something else. Amen? You're in the middle of trying to get something going to school. You're trying, and somebody just, bam! It's while Jesus was teaching, they interrupted him. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And, they, and w- then they had set her the word... A um, better translation is, and they threw her down naked in front of him. They set her up, they grabbed her, and they hauled her out. Now, personally, I would have said, where's the guy? But it was a set-up job. And they said to him, teacher, sarcasm, this woman oh, was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, always got to love righteous people. Now Moses and the law commanded us that, sh- that such should be stoned. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. This is one of the things you're gonna, you and I are going to find in life. If we're going to follow Christ, we're going to get set up. We're just going to get set up. So it's important that we pause. Notice what Jesus does. He kneels down. Doesn't say anything, just kneels down. He starts writing. It's the only place in scriptures that we know that Jesus wrote, at least on the New, in the New Testament. Only place he wrote. He starts writing in the ground. What did he write? He wrote the names of all their girlfriends. No. <laughs> we have no idea what he wrote. But Jesus paused. When you're faced in a personal conflict, when there's something when, when you're either attacked or you're finding yourself just <sighs> pause. Prepare yourself and listen to Abba. 
The Bible says, I will guide you. You will hear my voice. Great peace have those whose mind are stayed on thee. One of the most important things as people of the word of God who are attempting to live lives for Christ and like Christ, recognizing that we're going to have conflict in life, is that when that initial conflict happens, just don't react. At least don't react in the flesh. Just, just wait. Just pause. Calm yourself. Don't react instinctively. Act biblically. Assess why this bothers me. Allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you first. Amen? It's important that we calm ourselves. Every time we see Jesus doing this, when, when they brought him the, the money, the uh, Three of the four Gospels give the account of them. Is it right to pay Caesar taxes? And again, they're trying to entrap him. What's he do? Give me a coin. So they give him a coin. The Bible says he looks at the coin. Whose face is on it? Caesar's. See, the whole time that that's going on, the whole time that Jesus has asked for the coin, he hasn't immediately come back at him. The whole time he's waiting. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. How are we doing in that? I think as as we're getting further and further into closer to the end times, I think we need to be more and more in tune to the Holy Spirit. I think we need to know the Word of God. I think we need to have a daily time of reading and prayer. But I think we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit because He says He's always talking to us. Most of you know one of the most shocking on TV things that I've seen in my life was back in the 70s. And Merv Griffith, I think it was Merv Griffith, it was one of the, Merv Griffith had Oral Roberts on his program. And he was just hammering Oral Roberts from every direction. I mean, there was no, Merv Griffith could do that kind of, just hammering. And they were just across the table and there was the audience and taking questions from the audience. And at one point, Merv Griffin asked Oral Roberts, he says, now please, come on, Dr. Roberts, you say you hear from God. Do you really hear from God? Come on, please, please, please. Come on, you're not telling me God talks to you. Come on, come on, you've you, you got a doctorate, you're a genius, you've you've, raised, you've started this university, you've done this hospital. Come on, please, don't tell me that you really believe that you hear from God. Dr. Roberts never raised his voice once. He looked across the table and he looked right at Merv Griffin and he said, God not only talks to me, but he's talked to you, and you know it. Merv Griffin, they went to commercial, by the way. It was 90-some seconds, and Merv Griffin was just, I mean, the, 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 the deer in the headlights look, the cow at the new gate look. I mean, he was frozen. It was absolutely frozen. God still talks to people. And he desires to lead and to guide us. He says, if you go the wrong way, you'll hear the little whisper that says, no, not that way. Unfortunately, I always hear, not that way, dummy. (laughs) But the reality is, he's always seeking to guide us if we'll pause and prepare ourselves to listen to Abba. Don't overreact. Listen to what God has to deal, to say to us. The second point in, is A. It's, you, you need to, when, when we're at a position in dealing with conflict, especially with people, we need to affirm the relationship with the person. All conflict management starts with relationships. Amen? Our desire needs not be to win an argument but it's to let Jesus and the Word of God flow through us. Okay? 
most of you know I totally blew it in my first public experience speaking. Spoke to my high school, running for a student body office so I could get out of class. I got up there. I had taken some humble homegrown medicinal medicine so that I would be at ease and I couldn't even get out my own name. A total geek won by a landslide who was running against me. I walked out of the gym, walked straight down to the counselor's office, and I said, put me in debate. Put me in speech. I never again want this to happen to me. Shocking thing. But the problem with debate is present your argument so you defeat the other person. Now, the good thing in a debate class, and I debated through college, is that they will give you a topic for the next wherever the ba debates happen, and you have to research that topic. You do not know until you get to the debate whether you're pro or con. So you have to know both sides. But one of the things that's important as Christians is the word of God is the word of God. It's truth. It, just let the lion out. You don't have to defend a lion. Just let it out. Let it out in love. Let all things be done in love. You don't have to berate and embarrass the person. Even though it's fun to do sometimes. Affirm the relationship with the person. All conflict management starts with relationship. 1 Peter 3.8 Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, sisters, be tender-hearted and be courteous. That doesn't sound like I need to browbeat you or embarrass you in an argument. It sounds like I need to be led by the Holy Spirit and present the word of God and let truth do what truth does. Amen? 1 John 3, 14. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brethren abides in death. I will tell you that most of the discussions, and, I, and I, unfortunately I can't have them face to face. I would prefer, I always prefer having a discussion face to face when I'm dealing with something that might be controversial or conflict-inducing. But with the people that I have on Facebook and the, some of the people... Now, I am, I'm done trying to convince non-believers. I just love them and pray for them. But when I'm talking to the people I'm talking about right now are believers. One of them is uh, extremely well-educated has had very, uh, he's a pastor, um, and we've been friends for 30-some years, but very much into BLM, very much into social justice over gospel, in my opinion, very much, and, and this week posted, uh, well, while we don't believe abortion is right personally, we believe, and I went, no, 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 back that train up. Back that train up. Because as believers, our personal opinion doesn't matter. The Word of God is what gives us truth. We need to be a people who stand on the Word of God. You realize that Isaiah, Job, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, David, all wrote about God knitting to them together in their mother's womb. It's not just Psalms 134. It's not just Jeremiah 29.11 or Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. And so when I'm trying to talk to believers, I'm trying to talk to them in the, along the line of, what's the word of God saying? And I have to be real careful that I don't hit the capitals. 
But we're at a time where the Bible has called us to be at peace with all people as much as is possible within us. See, a lot of times it's easier just to fire off. Especially when I'm right. No. <laughs> you, you just... Uh, but, but the object is let the Holy Spirit do the job. It's not my job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict somebody of sin. Amen? Amen? It's Holy Spirit's job, not mine. I can say and lay out what the Word of God says, then they have to deal with the Holy Spirit. That's why when I pray often and before services or in my office or when I'm praying in here on Sunday morning early, I'm asking, Lord, I just pray for conviction. For those that of us that need conviction in an area, Lord, let us be convicted by the Holy Spirit to repentance. Lord, to those of us that need comfort, Lord, your very name is Comforter. Because we need to be recognized as people who are willing to adjust to the Word of God. Amen? So the first thing is prepare. Just pause. Prepare yourself to listen to Abba. Affirm the relationship with other people. This is one of the most important things if you're going to have a discussion with someone face to face. I normally, if I know I'm going to have a discussion and I feel that it's going to be, it needs to be scripturally based, I'll usually write out a bunch of scriptures first. I want to talk about, uh, just for a moment, and, and we're, we're coming off the verse that says, be at peace with all people. Have you ever heard about care-fronting versus confronting? In confronting someone, I feel deeply about an issue, and this issue is important to me. In care-fronting, while I may care about the issue, I care about this person and my relationship with this person. See, the church is not allowed, according to the Word of God, to write off believers because we have different opinions. Does that make sense? If we love one another. See, we can, what, what, over here on the, on the fence, over at uh, Liberty High School, they, they, somebody had the art class go love, and they got these little signs, love, 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 love. You know, there's these little, there's, there's 20,000 of these little posters, 7 by 11 or whatever, those little 8 by 11 things, and they all have love on them. And I'll bet none of those kids really understand what love means. The church, under, the church needs to understand love means being confrontational when you have to be confrontational, but not demeaning. Do you love your child when you spank their hand when they go to reach the hot stove? Or you just let them put their hand on the hot stove and go, told you so. Now, we've been, got to be demented parenting. But the reality is that we need to care front people. We need to worry or care about the relationship. In confront, confronting people, I also want you to know that I want to clearly express my view. I want you to know what I feel about this matter in confronting. I want to hear your view. One of the things we need to do better job as believers for both the world and each other is listen. Listen. Amen? One of the things that the person wrote this week was, well, the church is getting such a bad name because the church wants to prosecute women who've had abortion. Who said, huh? Because that's what I did. I wrote back, huh? What do you mean? I've never, never once in my life have I heard anybody wanting to prosecute. By the way, there are a lot of reasons a lot of people do a lot of things. And we without sin cast the first stone. Most of you have heard the story of because I'm adopted and because if abortion would have been legal and free and available when I was in the womb, I probably wouldn't be bothering you today. And because I'm certainly a product of um, nobody wants him. Anybody that's going to send their kid 2,000 and some miles away to hide him uh, certainly doesn't want their grandkid or their kid around. 
And, and so I it's not the fact. I lost my train of thought. Where was I going with that? See, nobody was paying attention. <laughs> what was that? Oh, no, no. There's a lot of reasons people do a lot of things. And by the way, if you feel hopelessness and you feel lost, why do we support you know, the, the, the home that, the, for unwed mothers? Because we're not just going to say you can't do, we're going to do everything we can on the other side. We're going to support you and love you. I just got an email from, I believe it was Angela, is that her name, Carol? Yeah, a few weeks ago, just thanking us. And I thought, good grief. Carol's the one that brought her there. Carol's the one. We just showed her love. She's got a little boy. She's got a college education. You know, it's just, I, I, I remember being a rampant, rabid uh, anti-abortionist and uh, not a biblical anti-abortionist, rabid, uh, emotional one. And just going off and knew, knew it was saved, probably 1976 or so. And our neighbor, um, Fred and Trish, um, she said, can I talk to you for a minute? And she was older. I mean, she was probably 30. And she said, can I talk to you outside? And I said, okay. And I went outside, and she says, you really, really hurt me. And I respected this couple tremendously. They were our neighbors, and I really loved them. They were good Christians. And I said, what did I do, Trish? She says, I've had two abortions. I wasn't saved. I was lost. I was alone. Nobody, and she went on. She says, but what you said and the way you said it really hurt. I walked back in the house. Now, the door was closed. I was so low, I could just walk under the door with it closed. I will never, ever, ever forget that encounter because she did the biblical thing. I did not. She took me outside. She told me that the way, she, she didn't say it was right what she did. She said the way that I addressed it was wrong. And she was right. And so I've never addressed that issue that way again because we do not know the heartache and the loneliness and the lostness that some ladies are going through. What they need is our support, not our condemnation. It doesn't mean that we ever approve or say it's the right thing to do. But if it's been done, it's been done, and there's forgiveness available, and there's healing available in Jesus Christ. It's how we approach those issues of whether we're going to win people to the Lord or not. Amen? Do we care enough about the relationship? Affirm the relationship with the person is mightily important. Do we want to hear their view? Do we respect their insights? Do we trust them to handle our honest feelings? Do we promise to stay in the discussion until it's reached an understanding without blowing up or anger? Will we not try to use trickery or distortion to make our viewpoint? See, that's when you care about when you're talking to somebody, and it's important. Because we need not to be a people who just want to win the argument. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Amen? It's important that we are the arbitrators, the, the givers of God's grace as it flows through us. It's imperative that we be people who release grace if we're going to receive grace. Amen? And so it really matters on how to deal with conflict biblically. Pause. Prepare to listen to Abba. By the way, if you're not reading the Word on a daily fashion, how do you know the Word you're hearing is a Word from God? 
Okay, it's not Brother Honeycutt putting his magical Bible upside his wife's head and giving her 12 years instant Bible knowledge. It's a disciplined day-to-day study of God's Word. I encourage you as much as I possibly can. Now, I know some of you may not even own a Bible that we, you know, you, I, I hear the leaves rustling. It must be the fall. No, no. A lot of the people have their Bibles on their tablets. I've got a Bible on my, my phone. And, but every day, read it. Every day. Every day. The second thing that Jesus would do, he, when, when, when he's here in John and he, they've got the woman down before him, he doesn't rebuke them. Please notice that. You low life, pond scum, jellyfish, bottom feeders. You guys set this girl up to try to set me up because every single account in the Bible shows that Jesus knows they're trying to set him up. No, he just writes and then he simply says, You without sin cast the first stone. Now, again, this is, you, you can preach 10 sermons out of this passage. Because what the Bible says, and they departed, beginning with the oldest. The older that we get, the more we realize we've messed up. When you're young, you're, Arr! I'm big and bad and all that other stuff. No, no, the older we get, the more we realize we are in need of mercy and grace. And then what does he do to the girl? Go and sin no more. He doesn't bring up the sin. Just don't go and sin no more. If we want to have a positive, healthy, biblical outcome to confrontations, we need to follow the Father. We need to pause, prepare to listen to Abba. We need to make sure that the person we're discussing with knows that we care about the person as much as we care about the argument. Does that make sense? Because if we're going to at peace with all people, they've got to know that we care about them. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider the other better than yourself. Ouch, that's hard. The building and deepening of restoring the relationship should be one of the goals when we're having discussions or conflict. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together. If you are willing and obedient, you'll get the best from the land. Here's the reality is, if we're willing to change some of our habits, if we're willing to be more biblical in Christ's life and how we confront extremely strong subjects, then we'll have a greater impact for the kingdom of God. Amen? The better the communicator, the better the listening. Characteristics of listening, caring Christians, love, practical, compassionate, sensitive, patient, giving love is critical if effective caring and listening is to occur. And this commandment we have from him, that's Jesus, that he who loves God must love his brothers also. By the way, that's one of the reasons that I don't continue in some discussions. Especially this one where, well, abortion's a personal thing. God will heal, he will forgive, and my heart goes out. But I'm just, I'm not going to discuss any more biblical truth because we've already done it once and you just keep wanting to weave around. Look, I'm not going to, our relationship's not going to grow with this couple. My relationship with this couple's not going to grow if I keep pounding on. So at some point, I just have to recognize that I love you, and we're just going to disagree on this. 
I've already stated what I believe the Holy Spirit has to say and what the Word of God has to say. But I'm not, because the more I go back and forth, how many of you have ever gotten into these discussions on Facebook? It's not like when we're talking or over coffee or something where we can get it over with face to face. It's post. No way. Post. Oh, come on. I got to go home. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, forget it. Look in the morning. And you recognize that after a while, you're wasting your time and you're wasting their time. So what I decided to do is just stop. Love you. We'll pray for you. That was it. That's it. See, there comes a time, be at peace with all people as much as is possible with you. I can't change them. Only the Holy Spirit can. Do they love Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, you know, I, I want to stay in a relationship. That's important. Patience implies sticking with a person or situation even when no change seems to be taking place. Patience is a fruit of the, is a fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Patience often develops in the midst of difficulties. James 1, count it all joy when you encounter various trials, tribulations, for it produces patience. I want patience and I want it right now. One of the things is when we're dealing in conflict, when we're dealing in, in problems, I mean, come on, let's be honest. In the days ahead, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to get into conflict with people. Our goal is not to get into conflict. Our goal is to retain the relationship so that we can talk to them about Jesus Christ as we listen to Abba. I want to talk, what the Bible is trying to teach us is I want you to be open to people. I want people to be open to you. We need to be open. Caring people should see our own weaknesses as our own as strengths. We often usually don't have a problem knowing where we're strong in an area. We often overglaze over those areas where we're weak. We need to develop genuine concern for others to show a willingness to accept others regardless of their beliefs. See, I'll accept you. People say, well, you hate gays. No, I don't. The the non-Christian community sets up so many straw dogs, so many straw arguments. Well, I'd go to church except they'd kick me out. I don't know what church would kick you out. I don't. We'd love you. We invite you. We want you. I'm going to tell you, it's God, not God's plan for your life. It's not God's best for your life. It's not what God has intended for your life. It's not how God prepared your life. God knows what it feels like to be lonely. He knows what, Jesus knows especially what it feels like to be lonely. He knows what it feels like to be the odd man out. Even his own family said he was nuts. Our brother's in there, and he is one piece of work. He's nuts. Notice his brother James doesn't become a disciple and after the, until after the resurrection. See, Jesus knows what it feels like to be alienated. He, feels, he knows what it feels like to be thought of as different. See, we need to align to people who, who are hurting and bring them hope. Not allow arguments of rejection. Amen? It's important that we love people to life. So, we're going to be open. We're going to infuse hope. Christian hope does not encourage people to deny the reality of their situations. Let me read this again so you understand what I'm saying. When we're talking about hope, we're not talking about, well, if you just trust Jesus, 
he's going to twinkle by with his two little sister fairies, and, and they got those little wands, and they're going to go poo and everything's going to be given your... No, no, no. Trust Jesus. Turn your life over. He's got a better plan for you. No guarantee that you're going to get out of the situation you got yourself into right at this moment. No guarantee you won't. But all too ho- often, we preach with the concept, just trust Jesus and, and, and you won't have any more worries. The Bible talks so life. you're going to follow me, Jesus said, you're going to suffer. It doesn't mean we're masochists. It just means that we accept that, that we're not going to be loved by everyone. So when we're talking about giving people hope, it's not to deny the reality of their situation. It's not to slip into inactivity or to engage in perpetual wishful thinking. Christian hope rejoices in God's sovereignty, His wisdom. It accepts the fact that God's timing and the ways of doing, our ways of doing things are not always His ways, and His ways are always perfect. Amen? Caring people point others to Jesus. If we're going to be a people who are going to win people to the Lord, if we're going to love people to life, then we need to live a life that's worth others exemplifying. We need to be flexible. Amen? I'm thinking about a story, but I'm not sure. My wife's going, no, 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 don't tell it. If you have to think about it, don't tell it. (laughs) I had a man get out of prison, come to the church. Good-hearted man, totally saved. And he didn't, couldn't do things, but he... He was a really good mechanic, and he wanted to really help people. So he would go, and, and he'd change the starter in your car. He'd, he'd change the oil. He'd do the brakes on your car, whatever you needed. And this lady said, well, I want him to change, do something, like change brakes. And he came to my house later that day just real hurt. And I said, what's going on, Glenn? He goes, man, she just screamed at me. And I said, you know, of course, in your mind, you're thinking, oh, man. What'd she scream at you for? Because I didn't buy all the parts to fix her car. I just showed up to fix her car. Well, she was married, and they had more than enough money for her to buy the parts. So I went to her. I I told Glenn, it's okay. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you for going over there. And then I said, what were you thinking? He said he'd do it. Lady, he doesn't have any money. He's fresh out of prison on a life sentence. He's trying to help you. Well, he he shouldn't have volunteered to do it unless he had the money. And I said, you got this wrong, sister. You got this about as wrong as you can get it. See, the problem is, we, she was so rigid. I said, I want you to apologize to him. You've been walking with the Lord, or you've been in the way. I won't say on the way. You've been in the way for 30, 40 years. You hurt him. And I want you to apologize. And she just, no, I never apologize. When we're that kind of rigid, when we don't acknowledge when we've made a mistake, when we don't acknowledge, we're seriously in trouble. If we blow it, acknowledge it. I don't know how long I was in the Lord, but I remember somebody said, Satan will always try to expose what, what your most embarrassing points in life. And I remember that... Uh, you know, he's going to try to make you cover up. And I thought, okay, we'll see how that works. Well, one of our daughters got pregnant out of wedlock, and, you know, people are saying you need to drop out of the ministry, you need to quit, you're not a fit pastor, you're not a fit. Come on, they're in high school. 
They made decisions. Now, we always prayed for our girls, Lord, if they sinned, let them get caught. Now, unfortunately, I should have prayed a little stronger. Don't let it have life consequences, but it's all good now. But I remember thinking, okay, we can, we can resign quietly and go away. What we did is, with their permission and their very much assist, insistence, she stood up in front of the church on a Sunday night and said, you know, I love the Lord and I've made a mistake. We're going to keep the baby and we're going to raise the baby. I mean, do you know how freeing that is? How freeing that is? What are you going to do now, Satan? What are you going to do now? <laughs> there was probably a hundred and some people there, and I said, okay, here's the deal. If you can't love her, support her, care for her, and the baby. There's the door. And unfortunately, being in my 30s, I said, don't let the door hit you where the Lord split you. <laughs> and about 30 people walked out. I think they planned on it anyway. And the church grew five times greater in the next six months. Because, look, we admit it. We admit it. And at the same time, we expect grace. And if we're going to be a people that are love people to life, if we're going to be a people that deal with conflict biblically, then we our outcome of, our, uh, of the conflict cannot be, I must win. <laughs> Keep in relationship and bring them closer to Jesus Christ. Amen? It's real important to me that, that we don't become a church that is, you know, what we've been accused of being is just this sort of right-wing fringe. No, I'm a biblical fringe. I'm not even a biblical fringe. I'm a biblical immersed. So we need to be flexible. We need to acknowledge it. We need to have humility. We never go into a thing, well, look what I'm doing for you. No, 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 no. Grace has been extended unto me, and I extend grace. Amen? And we need to know that caring for people is a growing experience, and it's not always a pleasant one. We are called to be at peace with all people as much as is possible within us. Jesus has shown us how to deal with confrontation and to diffuse it while not compromising the truth. See, that's important. That's why 2 Corinthians is there. Because we're not to compromise the truth. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That doesn't mean you're not going to have friends. But you know what? Bad company does corrupt good morals. It doesn't mean we don't have friendships in the world, but it means we don't make them our confidants and the most close. For what fellowship has, with, has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Uh, the verse, the, the section of 2 Corinthians there is not just dealing with eating things that are given to idols and that kind of stuff. It talks about how we treat other people. Are we going to love them but still stand firm? I hope every one of you have some sort of a relationship with somebody who is yet to be saved. If the only world you fly in is the church, you're not growing to what God wants you to grow. We need to have acquaintances and friends within the world. They don't shape our world. God's called us to help shape theirs. Amen? So we pause. When we get into conflict, we pause. 
we listen for what Abba has to say. We're attentive. We care about the other person. Amen? This isn't a hellfire sermon. We're running into a season in this nation when we need to stand strong. But we need to stand strong in love, not lawlessness. We need to stand strong in the truth of the Word of God, not finger pointing, unless they're pointing up in prayer. But we need to know the truth. Speak truth in love and allow God to work through us even in conflict. Amen? Now, next week you'll get U.S.E. That's the end of pause. But I really do desire that we be a people who love people to life, that we use the gifts that God has given us to His benefit, not just ours. Amen? You have people. Turn to somebody and say, you have. You have acquaintances. Unsaved. But God wants to touch through you. Now, that sounds, I'll tell you what. When I started to say that, I thought that's a good way. About halfway through that, I felt it was a word of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? I started it out as, this is a good thing and it's a truth thing. About halfway through that, I very clearly believe I felt the Lord say, I'm speaking to some people here through what's being said. God has some acquaintances. You have some acquaintances that God wants to reach and heal and bring to salvation through you. You need to stay in those relationships. Don't cut them off. Boy, there are some we'd like to. Amen? Let's stand. Father, we stand before you. And Lord, I, I realize that, Lord, you've called us. And Lord, it's not just about salvation. It's about how we live our life that others might see life and hope in us. You're the hope of glory. But Lord, I clearly felt the Holy Spirit say to us this morning that there are people that are only going to be reached because we know them and we will love them. You have people, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to some here this morning, you have people in your circle that God has designed that you bring them hope and salvation in Jesus Christ. I believe the Lord would also say that sometime it's difficult, but he's there to give us peace in the midst of it. Amen? Lord, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, Lord, I just, I ask, Father, if there's any here this morning who are not in the right place with Jesus Christ, and they want to become, they want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they want to start that life again, afresh and anew, Lord, with your plan prevailing over all. They're willing to say, Lord, I receive you afresh this morning. Just look up at me and we'll say, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Father, right now, I just agree with these. And Lord, I thank you that your healing power, your healing touch is flowing. You're receiving. You'll no wise cast out all those who come unto you. We come unto you and thank you for that new beginning. Lord, I pray right now. I extend my hands and I pray, Father, because I realize there's some situations within this fellowship, within this group this morning, that, Lord, these people... They have friends, neighbors, or relatives who they're, they, they're having a strained relationship with. Lord, I ask that you give them peace, supernatural peace. Give them favor and give them the right words with the right attitude in every situation. And all those that agreed said, Amen. Amen.